Well, I'm excited this morning to introduce to you my friend Stephen Trainer. Uh, if you've been with us for a while, you know Stephen. He's been here before. Stephen is, uh, I've tried to figure out in the last service how long I've known him. Uh, roughly 20 years, um, known Stephen as a youth pastor, I've known Stephen as an employee, a friend, colleague in ministry. Um, he kept my minivan on the road for far longer than it should have been. Um, and I, every, every, I would take it to him like, dang, he can fix it again. I was hoping I'd get a new one and it just never worked out. Uh, but I love to hear you speak and I love to hear you share about your ministry in New York City. And um, I was just, I'm on the edge of my seat every time you're here, and, and I'm just so thankful that you could be with us today. Uh, it's great timing, and uh, because you're here, I didn't have to prepare a sermon, so you're my man. <laughs> what, well, Stephen Trainer? Oh, wow, thank you. Hey, it's so good to be here. God bless you guys. This is, this is like a homecoming I'm pretty sure we, we, we might still be members here. Do they kick you off the list after a certain number of years? Uh, so, so good. I didn't know it would be record-breaking temperatures, but that's okay. It's all right. A little cooler today. Uh, my name is Stephen Trainer, and um, we're uh, missionaries in, 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 in New York City. Uh, many of you here have come and served with us in New York City. Uh, you've been a part of ministry for a long time. Some of you I know from many years uh, before that. So there's so many dear friends here. It's so good to be among you. And uh, I know in a church that's as large as Northside, where I'm privileged to meet some people for the first time today. And, and so we're, we're thankful for that as well. Uh, if you want to make your way over to Luke chapter 7, we will be there today. But it is going to take us a minute to get there because I'm, I'm going to try to accomplish two things uh, this morning and really only have time for one of them. Uh, my, my two goals today are to uh, introduce you to our ministry in New York City, which will just be an update for many of you who uh, have, have come and served with us in the past. And then we're going to talk about evangelism and, a, and, and, and an approach to evangelism that, that we believe is lightweight, low maintenance and sustainable. And that's all of our calling is, is evangelism. So those are my two goals today. Let me introduce you to my family first. I've got a picture of them. They are here somewhere. You'll see them milling about. Uh, this is my wife, Carrie. We're married now for 16 years, and our five children, oldest to youngest, are Ryan, Liam, Sean. Then's our only little girl, Audrey. And then Nathan is our baby boy. And uh, as I said, we're, we're missionaries in New York City, and to give you kind of the backstory, we moved to a Brooklyn neighborhood called Coney Island the first few days of 2015. So that's several years ago now, and we, we moved there as missionaries to meet the felt needs of this community, which are many. This is a community of deep poverty, but also to plant a church that would meet the spiritual need uh, of the folks who call that community their home. And we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to do it. And so we said, well, let's just start by helping a person. And so we did. We started tutoring a, uh, a GED student. We had one, one student in our, in our ministry, one adult learner who was trying to go back to school and, uh, and, and earn his diploma. And one student became two. And over time, that ministry, because it was God's ministry, we didn't, again, we didn't know what we were doing. We did our very best to to mess it up and to make all the mistakes. And we made mistakes we didn't even think people could make. But in spite of all that, God moved because it was, it was his ministry and he loves that community and wants good for that community and those people. And he wants to expand his kingdom and push back the darkness in that community. When God began, entered us into this discernment process, even going back a few years prior to 2015, when, when we began to feel this stirring and we said, wow, God, I think you're calling us to plant a church in, 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 in New York City. We don't really know what to do with that. My father and his uh, parents immigrated to New York in around 1975, but they made their home in the north suburbs, a place called Westchester County. And so we, as, as people might, we assumed Hey, God, if you're calling us to New York, we're going to go to the suburbs. Listen, I, come on, you guys know I look like I belong in the suburbs, right? I don't, I don't look like an inner city guy. You know, we're, 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 we're at home 
in the suburbs, and we blend in in the suburbs, and we feel safe and comfortable in the, in the, in the suburbs. But in this really couple year season of discernment many years ago, we experienced something that we didn't expect and we didn't know what to do with. We began to experience this deep conviction and we began to ask ourselves silly questions like, wait a minute, why is it that we've always understood God's will to be something bigger and more comfortable? Those things are fine, but it can't always be that way. And then we said, you know what, what if going to what we know and where we'd be most comfortable, we started asking questions like, well, well God, what's the community of greatest need in this city? What's the hardest place? What's the place that nobody wants to go to, God? And that was a neighborhood called Coney Island. It's in far south Brooklyn. It's right on the Atlantic Ocean. And if you look at the stats and the figures, it's kind of in a two-way tie for most impoverished neighborhood in New York City. There's uh, about 400 neighborhoods in the five boroughs, and so Coney Island tops the list. And we said, God, would you send us there? Would you give us that assignment? God, would you let us go to the places that maybe, maybe other people are unwilling to go? We don't, we're not anything special. But would you give us permission to, to, to try? And people thought we were insane. And they said, you can't do that. You, it's too dangerous. It's too poor. You have to go to a neighborhood where people can put more money in the offering plate. Or you're never, you're never going to make it. And there's wisdom in that, of course. But we said, you know what? That's just not where God's leading us. And I've been through all the church planter assessments and things. And the guys with the laptops ask you the questions. And, you know, they, they're the experts. They wrote all the books. And, and, and I remember I was in a room. This is probably 2013. A big man stood up in the middle of the room. And he pointed his big finger at me. And he says, what makes you think God would call you to a neighborhood like this? I said, because God's not bad at math. How many of you today believe that the creator of the universe can do some basic arithmetic? I think, that, I think God can count. And our neighborhood is a 0.7 square mile, little sliver of our nation's largest city where about 80,000 people live in a community that's largely without help and overwhelmingly without hope. And the only answer is the gospel. Don't you think he's got to be calling somebody? And we said, we don't know. We're nothing special. It might not be us, but we're going to have to do until some better folks come along. And so we moved to that community, and we started meeting the needs. And God blessed our yes. And that ministry, because it was his ministry all along, that started with serving a single person, grew to a ministry over time that, that fed 10,000 meals a year and enrolled 100 GED students a year and had a large, robust kids' ministry. And we saw a whole lot of people come to Jesus in an environment where a whole lot of folks said it was impossible. And we thank God every moment. And then after leading that ministry for seven years, God did something else that we didn't anticipate, we, we, we didn't like, quite frankly, he says, I want you to go to Minnesota. You guys been to Minnesota? Anybody been to Minnesota? We didn't know anybody. We couldn't even spell Minnesota. We'd never been to Minnesota. And he sent us to Minnesota, and we didn't get it. And he sent us to a wonderful church, a church much like this one, a large, vibrant, wonderful church filled with just the best people, almost as good as you guys. And we said, God, what on earth? What are you doing? And we realized we needed them. We had some things that we needed to heal from that we, did, we didn't even realize. You can't serve in a place like Brooklyn for, for very long without getting, getting a little bit wounded. And they loved us so well. And they became our family, just like you, you are our family. And it's been suggested by some others that they needed us too. And, and, I, and I hope that's true. 
But in an environment like Southern Brooklyn, in a place where few people want to go, finding a new pastor can be pretty tough. And the ministry never did. And after a couple of years without a senior leader, the ministry had, had lost all momentum. And as we heard that from all the way in Minnesota, it began to stir in us what, what I describe as a, as a holy discomfort. And our hearts broke as we, as we realized that that community was going to lose that ministry that God had used to bless so many people. And we prayed about that and we agonized over that. And one night, guys, I'm just telling you what happened. One night I awoke, it was the wee hours of the morning and I shot up and I was instantly, this has only happened to me one other time in my life. I, I awoke and I had just repeating them with this absurd clarity in my heart and my mind over and over and over again. The words that we find in Matthew chapter nine where it says that Jesus looked out on the crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And we knew what we had to do. And so we began a conversation with the board who were saying, hey, we're, we're out of steam. We don't know what to do. By the way, there's, there's nothing left. There's no building. There's no staff. There's no church services. There's no ministry programs left. There's, there's certainly no money. And we said, we'll take it. God, would you give us that assignment? Will you do it again, Lord? And so earlier this year, our family, we returned to Brooklyn to restart the work of that ministry, and God is moving, and we're so thankful. The minute, listen, it's a tough environment, and we're facing tough circumstances. There's no doubt about that. That's why we're so thankful for you. You, Northside, are one of our longest-standing church partners, and we couldn't do this without you. We thank God for you. We need your prayers. We're asking God to do some big things again. And we believe he will. Because he's still not bad at math. And he's not done with that community. So will you you join us as God brings us to your mind praying for for big things? Let me do this and we'll move on. Um, I'll put a phone number on the the screen. If you guys want to stay in touch with ministry, we have a, a prayer group that's on Facebook. It's private just to respect Uh, folks needs, but um, we share prayer requests as they arise there a couple times a week usually. We send out a monthly newsletter, these kind of things. If you're interested in staying in touch in those ways, uh, do me a favor. We'll leave this phone number up for a moment. Just send a text to this, uh, this number. It doesn't matter what you put in. And this week, give me a couple of days, but this week we'll follow up and we'll, we won't spam you or anything. We'll just send you one reply that says, hey, here's three links. Here's how to get these different updates and uh, you can avail yourself to those if you'd like. Is that okay? Well, like I said, we'll leave that up for a second, but we, we've got to shift gears. We've got to talk about evangelism. Is it okay if we talk about evangelism? Evangelism is our common ground. Evangelism is what Jesus has called his church to. Evangelism is what we're called to in New York City. And it's what you guys are called to here in Parker County. It's why God has put this church here for, we're over 100 years old now, right? Isn't that good? Evangelism is what we're called to. Jesus has given his church only one job, only one commission, and that's to make disciples. Everything else is extra credit. And discipleship always begins and includes evangelism. And so as we move forward, for the sake of time, I have to draw on a couple of assumptions. And I know what they say about assumptions. But I have to assume we agree on a couple of really important things. I have to, I have to assume that we agree today, all of us, that evangelism is important. And I have to assume that we agree today that we would we all understand that each of us, as individuals, are called to evangelism. Our walk with Jesus as his disciples is always anemic if we're not engaged in evangelism. But we've got to be honest about something, too. We start talking about evangelism. Inside some of us, there's, 
I mean, it happens to me, so I'm, maybe it happens to you. I may be the only mere mortal here today, but, but for me, evangelism can be tough. You guys ever find evangelism to be tough? And sometimes we experience things like guilt and shame around that because we know we're called to it, but we know it's hard. And because it's hard or maybe we've had a, a, a negative experience, we put our heart out there. It's a vulnerable thing to share our faith with someone. Sometimes it doesn't go the way we'd like. And sometimes, listen, none of us are gluttons for punishment, I hope. And so sometimes we stop doing it. We're going to look at an example of Jesus today and hopefully draw some encouragement from that. But let me encourage you with this first. Did you know Billy Graham even struggled with evangelism? The great Billy Graham, he's, he's easily the most renowned evangelist of the past century. Even Billy Graham struggled with evangelism. So what hope is there for us? Here's a story he tells in one of his books. Of course, Dr. Graham traveled all over the world, preached uh, the gospel to tens of thousands of people in these large sports stadiums. And one time he was in a new city, first time there to preach a crusade. But during the day before the crusade that was to be held that night, he had a personal errand to run. And so uh, he needed to find the post office. So he's wandering around town. He can't find the post office. He's looking for the post office. And so he finds it. This is before Google, okay? He finds a young man, a boy. He's about seven, eight years old. And he says to him, hey, can you help me find the post office? And the boy politely gave him directions. And then Dr. Graham did what any evangelist worth his salt would do. He invited the boy out to the crusade that night. He says, listen, son, come on out tonight. I'm going to be telling everybody how to get to heaven. And the boy looked at him and he says, mm, no, I don't think so. And he said, well, what do you mean? Why do you say that? He says, listen, mister, no offense, but you can't even find the post office. <laughs> listen, it, it's hard to share our faith, isn't it? It can be tough. And as, 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 as hard as it is for us as believers to share our faith, it's also hard for the not yet believers that we witness to. I, I wasn't raised in church, so I know what it's like to be on that side of the aisle. Have you guys ever been the target of someone sharing their faith? Or as some might say, have you ever been the victim of somebody sharing their faith with you? It can be, it's, 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 it's tough for them too. As I said, I wasn't raised in church. My mother, for my entire childhood, was a very outspoken atheist who dabbled in the occult. My father's from Glasgow, Scotland. He was a pretty angry, nominal Catholic who, to this day's nickname, is Kilted Heathen. The only, the only thing my parents had in common was that they were both teenage runaways on the day I was born. And I thank God for them. But I, I tell you all that just to help you understand we never a single time made it to church when I was a kid. Can you believe that? But I got invited to church. When, you guys ever been invited to church? I got invited to church one time. We had this, this family on our block. They were our next door neighbors, and we knew, everybody knew they were really religious. And they were a mystery. We didn't know what to do with them. We didn't know if we should, if, if we should feel sorry for them, if we should be afraid of them. But they were having a revival meeting at their church. And I was invited, so I decided to go to church. Heathen son is at church for the first time, and they had planned this thing and memorized the script, and they were really going for it. And the, what they had created was this kind of funnel, or trap maybe, where everybody there, all the guests there, had no choice but to get down at the front at the altar one-on-one -on -one with a counselor so they could share the gospel with you. This wasn't like a Billy Graham, hey, the bus is awake, come forward if you're ready to accept Jesus. It was, we got gotcha. you. You don't have a choice, here you are. And so I'm seven years old, I'm down front, and there's this gentleman, he's sharing the gospel with me. And I don't understand anything he's saying. He's talking to me about sin. And that, I didn't know what, I'd never heard that word before. I had a pretty colorful vocabulary at seven years old. I had learned a lot from mom and dad, but I, I, sin wasn't one of my words. And he's, he's talking to me about, about sin. And he's getting real frustrated because I'm not cooperating. I'm not doing my part. I'm not going with the program I just because I don't get it. I don't understand. And he says to me, he's, he, he, he says, listen, kid, let me, let me try this one more time. Sin is like this. Even stealing a cookie, even that is sin. So you've sinned, right? 
And this guy, is, he's so worked up, I, I don't understand what he's doing, but I know it's important. And I want to play along. I want to do my part. I want to get it right. So I thought and I thought and I thought. And you know what? I couldn't remember a single time that I had stolen a cookie. <laughs> there weren't a lot of rules in my house, guys. Like, you didn't have to steal cookies at my house. And so I had to, I was heartbroken. I had to tell the man. I said, listen, sir, I'm sorry, but I have never sinned. And we, I think we were both near tears about that point. <laughs> and we decided to part ways. <laughs> Listen, evangelism can be tough, right? You know why I didn't accept Jesus that night at my neighbor's church? I have every reason to believe the gentleman said all the right things. He stuck to the script. He had gone to all the trouble to memorize the thing. I know he did his part. But I didn't have ears to hear. Jesus talks a lot about having ears to hear. He's using words like sin and salvation. And at that point in my life, I wasn't real sure whose team Jesus was on. So I didn't have a place to put these words that he was sharing with me in this, this gospel. It was like drinking from a fire hose. Now, from over the subsequent years, from that time as a, as a young boy through my adolescence and into my adulthood, from time to time, not a lot of people, but, but people from time to time would share the gospel with me. But I never had ears to hear. Ears grow really slowly in the kind of environment that I was raised in, and we need to understand that that's true of a lot of folks. There's a great tool called the Engle Scale that helps us understand that Everybody is on a journey toward Jesus. I believe that's God's heart. I believe it's God's will that all people uh, make Jesus king of their lives. And so everybody's on that journey, but, but not everybody's near, not everybody's at the same place. And so we can illustrate the Engle scale with a simple number line. You guys remember number lines? Number lines work like this. Uh, you've got positive numbers, you've got negative numbers, you've got a zero in between. And on our scale here, we can think of that moment of salvation as the zero. That's the time when somebody finally gets it, they hear the gospel, they understand it, they can respond to the gospel, they can accept Jesus and trust him for salvation. That's zero on the number line. And then as they mature over time, over the rest of their lifetime, as a follower of Jesus... That can be represented by the positive numbers, one, two, three. So somebody who's a positive 10 is a more mature follower of Jesus who, than somebody who's a, a two. And that relationship began at zero, okay? One of the mistakes I've long made and I think is commonly made is that we limit our understanding of discipleship to zero, to that time when somebody accepts Jesus. But I think we need to understand that discipleship uh, and evangelism begin, uh, through evangelism, discipleship begins way over in the negative numbers because everybody's on that journey. Somebody at a negative 10, might, maybe they've never heard the name of Jesus or maybe they're completely hostile to the idea of Jesus. Maybe they're a devout Muslim, for example. And so they're not trying to hear it. How do we go from negative 10 to negative 1 and so forth and get them closer to, to, to Jesus? As we share our faith, as we go out and do what Jesus has called us to do, and that's to engage in evangelism, by my observation, I would say about 5% of the people we encounter have ears to hear, who are ready to hear the gospel. They're at that place in their journey. I'd say it's about a negative 1% where they're, they can understand the gospel when we share it and they can respond to it. The trouble is, and what I think makes evangelism so tough, is that we spend, I know this was my experience for a long time, maybe it's been yours, I don't know, but we, in the, the evangelism paradigm we sometimes inherit or create for ourselves, we spend 100% of the time preparing for about 5% of the people we may encounter when we do evangelism. And it, it becomes a scenario where if your only tool is a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. 
But not everybody's ready for a hammer. And we go out and we encounter folks and we have a sermon ready for them or we have a track ready for them and we're, we have an apologetic ready for them. We're ready to answer their questions, but the, the trouble is they're not ready to ask them. And it creates a very negative experience. They're not trying to hear it and we become very discouraged and then we're less likely to continue engaging in evangelism. And we need to understand, folks, if you only get one thing from me, if you only take one thing with you today, let it be this. We have to understand that people need to see the gospel before they're ever ready to hear the gospel. And I believe that's universally true. People need to see the gospel before they're ever ready to hear the gospel. And as we go out, yeah, about 5% of the people are ready to hear. They only got there, though, because they've encountered the gospel time and time again, tangibly seen it lived out in the lives of others. Over years, over the course of their lifetimes, usually. But we can't limit our evangelism efforts to the 5% of people who have ears to hear because we as the church of Jesus Christ have equal responsibility for the other 95%. And we're going to look at an example in Jesus' ministry here in Luke chapter 7. We're going to see two encounters. We're going to see people at two different places on our Ingle scale. One I'm going to put out about a negative one, and the other one's somewhere else, not even close. See if you can discern which. This is Luke chapter 7 beginning in verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. And when the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected uh, Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them, but just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I'm not worthy of such an honor. And he goes on to explain. He says, I understand your authority because I am one under authority, and I'm one who has authority. He says, just say the word, and I know it will be done. Jumping down to verse 9, it says, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And the officer's friends returned to the house. They found the slave completely healed. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate, and the young man who had died was a widow's only son. A large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearer stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And it goes on to say, everyone was in awe. And the word spread that a great prophet of God had visited this people. In the first half of that passage we see Jesus interact with a man who already has great faith. I'd say he's in that 5%. He's a negative one on our scale. He's he's this close already to a relationship with Jesus. It says Jesus himself was amazed at his faith. And then uh, his next interaction is somebody who's in a very different place. There's nothing here to lead me to believe Jesus is looking for this woman. He just happens upon her as he's going uh, to his next destination, and he, he sees that she's in great pain. This is the worst day of her life. And it says that he has compassion. And then what's he do? He gives her a sermon? No. But how often can that become our answer to everything? And how often can that become our only tool for evangelism? I believe this. Had Jesus preached a sermon to this woman at this moment, I think she would have been crushed. I think she would have been hurt. I think she would have been insulted. And it's not because preaching's bad. Preaching is great. It's necessary. I'm all for preaching. Listen, I came a a long way to preach at you guys today. I'm for preaching. But just like any good thing, the poison is in the dose. There are life-saving medications that if we take too much or at the wrong time, we'll, we'll take our lives. 
And we need to know that as necessary, vital, and transformative as preaching is, it's got to be the right time and in the right dose, or we can do some harm. We can actually push people away from Jesus. Had Jesus decided to preach to her in this moment, every word he said would have been true. It would have been gospel truth. It wouldn't have been untrue, but I believe it would have been unkind. Instead, what's he do? He says, don't cry. And he loves her. And he displayed an act of unexpected kindness, and it changed everything. Here, his act of kindness was raising her dead son, and I fully appreciate that's a pretty high bar that many of us in here today might be uncomfortable with. But he always did something practical. He always did something tangible. Jesus never just preached to people and disappeared. He met needs. He served people. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He had compassion and comforted those in need. And I believe that our evangelism, church, if it's going to be sustainable, our evangelism should follow that example of Jesus. We should always lead with acts of love and kindness always in Jesus' name, never random acts of kindness. Because here's what happens when you, when you serve people in unexpected ways. They will always ask you, why on earth are you doing this? And the response should always be, because I want you to see today just how much God loves you. In that exchange, it doesn't matter where on our scale that person is. If, if they have ears to hear, now you have an open door to articulate the gospel to them. But if, they, if they're not yet ready to hear the gospel, they get to see the gospel. And that person that's at a negative nine just moved to a negative 8.5. And with enough of those gospel nudges, they'll have ears to hear. And they'll make Jesus king of their lives. That's my encouragement to you today, church, as we go out and we share our faith as we've already agreed. You guys agreed. We're called to do. Follow the example of Jesus and lead that way. I'm not going to tell you how to serve people because I don't know who you're going to encounter today. I don't know who you're going to bump into tomorrow. But my, my encouragement is to be ready to be looking and you don't have to find the big things. Step into those big moments. Sure, God will open those doors, but you don't have to wait until somebody's at a funeral to serve them. In fact, I believe it's the small things that are most profound. Pay for somebody's drink at Starbucks. Uh, pay for the gas at uh, somebody at the next pump. Mow a lawn. Give somebody a, a bottle of cold water on a, on a hot day. Don't get hung up on the it. The it is not that important. It's the why on earth would you do this that changes people's lives. I've seen grown men weep because we gave them a dollar. Wash their car. Like that, it, the dollar's not important, but it's that encounter with the love of God that changes things. Let me invite the worship team up as we prepare to close. I'll, I'll, I'll share this. Um, just an example of our ministry recently. And we don't have this all figured out, but we're, we're, we're trying stuff. Here's something we tried recently. I was reading the newspaper, and uh, there was an article about a store in my neighborhood. I recognized the store. My, my oldest son, Ryan, comes out and does ministry a full day with me every week. And uh, as we do, we prayer walk the neighborhood, and we walk by the store that I'd read about in the newspaper. And the article in the newspaper said this, the, every people group in New York City have their niche, right? They generally gravitate to certain types of employment. And these stores, they're almost always staffed by men from Yemen, a, a place called Yemen. And if you don't know about Yemen, Yemen is a, a profoundly orthodox Muslim country. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no documented Christians in Yemen. Osama bin Laden's father is from Yemen. And there's a lot of folks from Yemen in our community, and uh, this guy was one of them. And so the article says he's working in the store. Some guys come in. They asked him, asked for him by name. They used some racial slurs, and then they beat him so severely that he was hospitalized. And as I read that, that, that story, I thought, wow, I bet Jesus, who had compassion on this woman who 
lost her son, I, I bet he has compassion on this gentleman. And I felt the Lord say, yeah, I do. What are you going to do about it? And so as we were prayer walking in the neighborhood, we saw the store. I said, Ryan, let's go in the store. We're going to buy a bottle of water. And now we always do. And we'll walk, you know, 12 or 15 blocks out of our way to do it. And here's what happens. The, 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 the first time we went in the store, I've studied Arabic for several years. And the first time we went in the store, uh, I, I encountered the gentleman right away. I recognized him from the article. The, the stores are really small. And so he and I kind of passed each other on an aisle. And there was something in the way. It was like a bicycle was on the floor. And he says, oh, let me get that out of your way, sir. I'm so sorry. And I said to him in Arabic, I said, no, no, no problem. It's fine. And he froze. There's a rumor going around that I don't look like a guy that might speak Arabic. <laughs> and he says, you speak Arabic? He says to me in English, and I, I answered him in Arabic. I said, yeah, well, a little bit. I study the Egyptian dialect. And so then he starts speaking to me in Arabic. He says, well, where are you from? I can see the wheels turning. He says, where, where, where are you from? I said, I'm from here. I'm from America. My father's from Scotland. I'm letting him know there's no good reason for me to be speaking Arabic other than this conversation. And we bought a bottle of water, and we left. And then we came back several days later, and guess what? I mean, he recognized us because he remembered that exchange. And we had another conversation in my bad 3 out of 10 Arabic. And we bought some water, and we left. And we did it again and again and again. And we continued to do that. And now we're friends. His name is Riyadh, and Riyad, pray for Riyadh. Riyadh needs Jesus. We came out of the store recently. I said to my son Ryan, I said, son, do you understand what we're doing? Riyadh needs Jesus. But he's not ready for a sermon. He's not ready for a track. Put yourself in his shoes and imagine how he would receive that message. It would sound a whole lot like this. Hey, buddy, I'm really sorry some guys with crosses around their neck came in here and beat you unconscious. But I need you to know that 1,600 years of your family's identity... Everything you've ever known and believed and held dear, your, the structure of your nation's government is all a lie, right from the pit of hell, but you're welcome. I'm here, a perfect stranger. Believe what I say. I just don't think it would land very well, folks. What do you think? <laughs> and it would all be true. So you know what we do instead? We go buy some water, and I do my best to speak to him in his language. In a day's coming real soon. He knows. His, listen, the U.S. State Department says Arabic is the third most difficult language on earth. And I believe it. I've studied it for five years, and I'm just scratching the surface. He knows how difficult it is. He knows that I've got no business studying this language. There's no practical purpose outside of this relationship. And he's going to ask me, Stephen, why are you, why are you, do, why are you studying this language for so long? You're, you don't need to. And... And then I'm going to have the chance to share with him, well, Riyadh, I, I, I have a lot of friends like you who are Muslims and who speak Arabic. And I love them. And I care about them, and I want them to know that I love and care about them. And so I study their language so that I can speak to their hearts. And I have a funny feeling nobody's ever done that before. And that's going to be a gospel interaction. And I don't know where he's going to land after that, but he'll be a little closer to zero than he used to be. I believe that. And I think God's going to use that. And so that's my encouragement to you today. Listen, you, <laughs> I'm not saying you've got to learn a language. Uh, I'm not saying you have to raise the dead. But as you go... Just be intentional. Look for ways to, 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 to bless people, to serve people. And even if they don't have ears to hear, help them see the gospel. And that'll change everything.